Welcome everyone to Boiler Boot Camp Session 1. This is the first of six sessions of a transformative experience. My name is Eric Scheidel. I am the HVAC Service Mentor. And uh, we are here live, and some of you may be catching this on the recordings, and that is uh, perfectly fine. Um, I'm very happy to have you all here today. And I want to kind of open up our first session by letting you know what the spirit of this class is and uh, what the intent is for you all to come away with when this is concluded. Now, I first began my obsession with hydronics and with boilers way back sometime around 2000 or 2001 uh, at that point in time. And I was a, a relatively new technician. I'd been in the business for uh, doing forced air service for a number of years and thought I was pretty well on to things. And I started working for a company that was a new division of an established plumbing and piping and pipe fitting contractor. And so we were the new guys in the company. And it just so happened that a friend of the owner wanted to have their heating system checked and it was a boiler and I was really the only service technician in this brand new department and I got the lucky job of going out on this boiler and I had never really worked on a boiler before and when I got there I saw a lot of things that I wasn't familiar with. Now I saw a few things that I was familiar with too. For example I saw you know igni ignition system and I saw burners and I saw a thermostat and I saw um, some electrical stuff, you know, electrical controls. Instead of a fan, there was a pump, so that, that made sense. There was a flu. So there's a lot of things that were familiar there. There's a lot of things that were unfamiliar too. And me being who I am, I could just not tolerate not knowing what those things were. And that began my process of, of, of field study, um, book study, and field experimentation. Uh, which led to an awful lot of learning and knowledge, and which helped me help others. And so over the years since that first uh, boiler system that I looked at, I have been involved in just about every type of hydronic heating system imaginable, uh, from some of the earliest systems installed in the uh, uh, turn of the century, around 1900, all the way through the most modern, complex systems that are created today, both residentially, commercially, and in institutions like hospitals, in, in schools, and very large systems in office buildings and things like that. So um, one of the things that uh, gradually became to make itself aware to me, or be, that I became aware of, is a lot of the issues that hydronic ex systems experience are related to um, uh, one of the unique features of piping systems, and that is that an individual who's putting a piping system together has a lot of leeway to be able to use their own creativity and self-expression. Uh, a lot of people say that piping is an art, and it is. And in that art is room for self-expression. And now sometimes what that means is it doesn't always get done in the best functional way. And that can create problems that go on existing for long periods of time or create other problems that remain the core reason for it remains undiagnosed. So this course was built with my own personal experience in mind, which I know a lot of other people have similar experiences. If you're familiar with forced air heating systems, or maybe you're a plumber, a uh, service plumber, who's going out on a no hot water call and it turns out to be a boiler system, or it's a water leak and it turns out to be a boiler system, and maybe you're not fully familiar with all of the hydronic boiler magic that makes a boiler system a boiler system, that makes it different from a forest air system, or makes it different from a domestic water piping system. Um, and so those are the things that we're going to focus on in this course. We're not going to be focusing on um, ignition systems. We're not going to be focusing on fuels. Uh, because hydronic concepts apply regardless of what fuel is used, whether it's gas or oil or electricity or wood or whatever they're going to come up with next, um, even refrigeration-based systems, hydronics is hydronics. And that is the part that having a, a foundational understanding in is what makes you a strong technician in the field. 
So when we complete this course, you are going to understand the different types of boilers and their piping systems and how they all work together. We're going to be understanding zoning systems, high efficiency systems, and even some of the more complex systems that are out there. But you have to crawl before you can walk. So this first session here, session one, is going to be about some of the fundamental basics that is going to be true for every boiler system out there. And uh, so right now we are going to go ahead and get started with that. First of all, how to get in touch with me. If you haven't already visited the website at HVACServiceMentor.com, please do. And uh, visit it frequently because you will see new articles posted there from time to time. You will also see uh, new classes become available from time to time. And we have uh, educational courses on all things HVAC, primarily service focused to help people become more effective, more accurate, faster, better troubleshooters and service technicians in the field. And if your primary function is that of an installer or a plumber, there's lots for you here as well because it's all the same kind of stuff. Uh, if you want to email me about something like that, Eric at HVAC Service Mentor is how to do that. If you want to get in touch with us about this course particular, in particular, there is a specific email for that, and it is this. I'm going to type it up here. It is helpdesk at HVACServiceMentor.com. Helpdesk at HVACServiceMentor.com is where you will correspond with specific questions about this course and anything having to do with it. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook. Like us on Facebook. Like the page, uh, facebook.com forward slash HVACServiceMentor. All right, enough of that stuff. Let's get to it. First of all, I want you to take a good look at this picture. Welcome to the boiler room. This is a pretty complicated boiler room. This is, there's a lot of stuff going on here. And I choose this picture because of its complexity. When you first look at this picture, you're like, holy cow, there's so much to look at, you don't even know where to look first. And this is why I want to start. I want to start with the hard stuff first here for a minute. And I want to let you know, that when you find yourself in this situation, take a deep breath and take a pause for a minute and look around. Really just look, just pause. This moment right here, when you first walk into an unfamiliar boiler room, very well could be the most important moment. And it's important to handle this moment correctly. And by, by that I mean, take your time, take your time. Even a hands-down expert in boiler systems is going to walk into this room for the first time and not know what he or she is looking at until he or she takes the time to do so. And that takes time because there's a lot to see. There's a lot to know. There's a lot to understand. So I want you to write a couple of things down um, either on this page or the next page put it on this page right here. And I'm going to write these down too. Some of the first things that you want to observe when you first walk into a boiler room, such as this one, or any in a home, apartment building, whatever it is, is number one, what kind of boiler is in use here? Because the type of boiler that is being utilized is going to dictate different parts of how the system needs to be piped, how the system needs to be operated, or what to look for, how it will be operated. The second thing I want you to think, look for is what direction does the water go? Try trying to figure out where the water goes can be a challenge for anyone. And if you're new in boilers, don't get nervous and say, feel like you got to go look important and go do something. Just calm down and just focus and figure out where the water goes. And that could take some time, especially if you walk into a room like this for the first time. Uh, I see, we can't see what I'm typing right now. Okay, sometimes I have to click on the side and then it shows up. So there it goes. Thank you for, thank you for letting me know that. All right. 
Uh, it takes some time to figure out which direction the water goes, but that's one of the first things you have to know. Uh, you need to know which direction the water is moving, and uh, that is one of the most crucial factors of being able to troubleshoot anything from that point forward. What direction does the water go? And then the third thing that you want to know is um, where does the heat go? And by where does the heat go, I mean what type of terminal devices do we have? What's actually heating the conditioned space? It's um, a very common mistake that a lot of technicians will make is that they will pigeonhole themselves uh, or put the blinders on and just only focus in the mechanical room. Well, the mechanical room is a part of the whole hydronic system, but it's really a small part of the entire system. That whole rest of the building out there is a very important part of the hydronic system, and before you can do a whole lot of good, you at least have to have a basic awareness of what's out there. What kind of a system do I have? What kind of heating terminal devices do I have? And we call those emitters. We'll talk about the different types of emitters later today. And then after that, the fourth thing, where my, uh, are my, I'm not just going to use the word accessories for right now. And the, those are the, my water side devices, my things, things like circulator pumps and expansion tanks and fill and feed systems and uh, those types of things. And we'll get more into those in one of our, our future lessons. We're not going to focus too much on those today. But that's the, the fourth thing is that we figure out. Once you have finally laid eyes on those things and you have developed a rudimentary understanding of, of answered these four questions, then you can begin addressing whatever specific problem is there. And believe me, I know that it feels like pressure, especially if you're you have a customer or a customer's representative right there with you and you walk into this unfamiliar boiler room and you don't want to feel like you don't know what you're doing or you don't want to look like you don't know what you're doing, don't worry about it. It's okay. Everybody feels that way. And as long as you get comfortable with not knowing everything, you're going to be fine because nobody knows everything. And the longer you work in the trade and starting here with boilers, the longer you do it, the more you're going to learn. And ideally, you're never going to stop learning. Uh, so walk in with an open mind and look around, pay attention. And that is going to do so much for you moving forward is just follow these four simple rules. And for the rest of this class, the rest of this course, I'm going to teach you exactly how to do that. I'm going to stop and see if we have any questions here. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today here in session one? These are the major points we're going to talk about. We're going to start off with BTU basics. These are some of the fundamentals of heat transfer and hydronics in general. Hydronic heating concepts. Uh, which aren't super tough, but when we come when we we're in those situations where we just pull our hair out sometimes in a boiler room, sometimes it's these are the things that are the important things to remember. What are the different types of boilers, and what makes them similar from, to one another, and what makes them different from one another, and how do I identify them quickly in a mechanical room? What types of emitters do we have? Same kind of deal. How do we uh, identify those, and what do they do? And we're also going to talk about some of the more basic piping systems. Uh, someone asked me about this course, are we going to get into some of the more complicated piping systems? Yes, we are. But once again, first we have to crawl before we can walk. So we're going to start with the basics and we'll get into the more complicated systems uh, toward the end of the class, of the course. So what is hydronics? Hydronics is a funny term. Not everybody knows what it means, right? It's not something that comes up in everyday speech. And when you hear the word hydronics, most folks, their brain thinks hydraulics which is a completely different idea. Hydronics is a fancy word that really all it means is using water as a medium to transfer heat. So we're going to put heat energy into water, then we're going to move that water with that heat energy someplace else and release that heat energy in that new location. That's what all hydronics means. Hydronics doesn't always necessarily mean a heating system. Hydronics can also be a cooling system. Uh, in larger commercial buildings, we'll have a hot water system and a chilled water system that is being driven off of a chiller. 
The chiller is just like a boiler. Instead of adding heat to the system, it removes heat from the system. Either way, whether we're heating or whether we're cooling, we're using water as a means of moving heat from one place to another. And that's really the core of hydronics. As a result, hydronics is a huge area. It's a huge topic. There are lots of things that can be done with hydronics. For example, in your car or truck engine, you know you have a radiator. And you know that there is water being pumped through the engine block that is taking heat away from the engine block and the uh, combustion process happening in that engine and then running it through that radiator, blowing air through the radiator and depositing that heat to the outdoors. That is a hydronic system. That is a hydronic system. We're using water as a medium to move the heat away from that engine and get it and deposit it someplace else. Uh, so, so many things can be done with hydronics and uh, the possibilities are really limitless, which is really exciting. It can also be intimidating because that means that a lot of hydronic systems can get very complicated, and that's true. But we will give you the foundation that you need to work through those complicated systems. So to try to make, some, make things simple, this is really the most basic hydronic system, a hot water bottle. You fill the bottle with hot water, right? And there's heat in that water. And then you put the bottle on the thing that you want to warm, like a grandma's aching knees, or your aching knees, depending on how long you've been in the trade. And uh, heat will transfer from that warm water into that cooler surface, whatever that is that you want to heat. And then when the heat has gone out of that water, we bring that water back, maybe put it in the microwave and add heat to it, or dump the cool water out and put more hot water back in. And, and bring it back. And, and that's really essentially what a hydronic heating system is. We're putting heat in water, moving that water to a new location, releasing the heat from the water to the thing that we want to heat, and then bringing the water back to the original location to get some more heat and just repeat the process over again. In a typical hydronic heating system, which we're going to be talking about for the rest of this course, our heating systems, in a typical hydronic heating system, that process is continuous, right? We're not taking a, a, a container of water, moving it over here, and moving it back over here. What we're doing is we're taking a stream of water through a pipe and constantly circulating it around and around and around. Same basic idea. So as we're talking about heat, it's important that we identify what heat is. And this isn't really easy. We think it's easy at first, but the more we look at it, the more we realize, boy, this whole heat issue is a little more complicated than it is on first glance. All uh, people who are um, walking the earth, they understand the difference between warm and cold, right? Hot and cold. And we associate heat with temperature, and that's only natural. But as technicians and as mechanics and as people who are involved in heat transfer and the, the movement of energy from one form to another and from one place to another, we have to have a more comprehensive idea of heat, and this is where it gets a little tricky, because you can't necessarily hold a handful of heat energy, right? You can't do it. You can't necessarily uh, take a bucket full of heat energy and put it on a scale and weigh it to see how much is there. You can't take out a tape measure and, and measure to see how long it is or, or anything like that. Heat energy is kind of elusive. You can't actually see it or measure it. We do have a unit of measurement for heat. It's called the BTU. Uh, BTU is an acronym. It stands for British Thermal Unit. So now that you know that you have British Thermal Units, that's really not all that helpful. What the heck is a British Thermal Unit? How does that relate to anything else? It, honestly, it's a little bit arbitrary. Here's the actual definition of a British Thermal Unit. The quantity of heat required to raise one pound of pure water, one degree Fahrenheit, at sea level. That is the definition of a BTU. That in itself isn't really all that helpful to really visualize what a quantity of heat is either. But the important thing that comes out of here is that uh, heat energy isn't able to be measured directly. You can't measure heat energy necessarily all by itself. But what you can do is measure the effect that heat energy has on something else. Now, humans have been involved in uh, working with water as one of the basic foundational things of science for since humankind started investigating the world around us. 
And that's why water is kind of the gold standard. It's one of the oldest units of measurement or comparison in science is water. And it just became that water was the gold standard. So they decided that however much heat it takes to change the temperature of water, that is one heating unit of energy, British thermal unit. Of course, British because uh, the United States was originally a British colony. And at that time, the British were measuring things and things like feet and inches and miles and yards and pounds and ounces and BTU. If we were living in Europe right now, or in Japan, for example, they all use the metric system. So instead of measuring things in feet and inches, we'd be measuring them in meters and millimeters and centimeters and kilometers, and everything would be based on 10. And our temperature would be in Celsius, and our BTUs would actually be in kilowatts. Notice watts is electricity. It's a unit of energy. Units of energy are interchangeable. Uh, energy is energy. So we're going to be focusing on heat energy. So all that, long story short, what I suggest you do that works for me is I like to think of BTUs kind of like pellets or nuggets or like, like BBs in a way, like I'm putting BBs into a jar or little pellets of something. They're little heat pellets, they're little heat units, and they can move into a substance and they can move out of a substance. And when we're using heat, I'm sorry, when we're using water as a medium to transfer heat, What's essentially happening is we are loading heat pellets into this fluid and moving those heat pellets downstream with the fluid to some place and then offloading those pellets somewhere else. Uh, one person described it in a really nice way that I really like it. You can kind of almost think of, a, think of a, um, a hydronic system like a train. So the train stops at a station and it picks up a bunch of people. We can think of these people like heating units, like BTUs. And the train moves down the tracks, and it gets to the first station, and it lets some of the people off. Uh, still have some people on, but it lets some of the people off. We can think of that first train station as um, one of the emitters in our heating system. And then the train goes down the track, lets a few more people off. And uh, next station, a few more people off, until it comes back around to where it started again to get another load of people. And that's kind of the way I like to think of BTUs as they move into the hydronic system and as they move out of the hydronic system as the water circulates around, absorbing and rejecting those BTUs or those passengers. So now that we know a little bit about the nature of heat energy and how it's measured in BTU, and how BTU is unable to be measured directly, but it, it can be, we can measure the effect that it has on the temperature it changes in something else. We need to be aware that heat energy in the way that it moves follows a couple of really important uh, unchangeable laws. Heat energy is going to follow some laws. And so as we are uh, manipulating heat energy, as HVAC and hydronics technicians, uh, everything that we do follows these laws, and everything that heat energy does is going to follow these laws. So knowing how these laws work is very important to always have in the back of your mind when you're in analyzing a heating system. So first things first, the biggest and most important law regarding the movement of heat energy is that heat energy will move from a warmer body or an area of higher temperature to a cooler body or an area of lower temperature. And this is one of the laws of thermodynamics that physicists spend a lot of time thinking about, engineers spend a lot of time thinking about. But for you and I, basically what it means is that heat moves from warm to cold. It doesn't go the other way, right? We can't inject cold into something. Heat is always moving from warmer to cooler, and it's always taking place. The second law is that the greater the difference in temperature are between these two bodies or between these two places, the faster heat will move. So heat moves from a warm place to a cold place, and the greater the difference between the warm place and the cold place, the faster that heat will move. Now, we don't create these laws, but the, the heating systems that we work on are designed to follow these laws and take advantage of these laws. So if we're ever having a trouble with our heating system, these laws are, in fact, taking place. So to illustrate this, I want you to think about two bricks. One brick is 70 degrees and one brick is 50 degrees. And let's pretend for right now that the only way heat is moving is from the warmer brick 
into the cooler brick. And that's what's going to happen. Heat will move from the warmer brick into the cooler brick. And because the difference in temperature between those two bricks is 20 degrees difference, the speed at which those BTUs will move from the warmer into the cooler is determined by what that temperature difference is. Now it's also determined by the material the bricks are made of and the, the mass of the bricks themselves. But so for right now, to keep it simple, we're going to assume that both bricks are made of the same material, they're both the exact same mass, and there's nowhere else for that heat to go. Now imagine for a minute that we have two more bricks. One is at 90 degrees and the other is at 20 degrees. And the speed at which that heat, and these, I'm sorry, this is not the best animation. These are supposed to be moving faster than these were. The heat is going to move faster from the 90 into the 20 because the temperature difference is so much greater. The greater the temperature difference, the faster the heat moves. Whenever we're talking about transferring heat, which is all that we're talking about when it comes to heating systems, right? Whenever we're talking about transferring heat, we're always talking about a quantity of heat energy in BTUs over a period of time. So it's always decided as BTUs per hour. That's the, the standard description of the rate of heat transfer. BTUs per hour. Um, total amount of BTU transferred is not as important as the rate of transfer, BTUs per hour. In the wintertime, our home or our building, heat is leaving the structure and moving to the outdoors. Why? Because heat moves from where it's warmer to where it's cooler. It's warmer inside, which is what we want, when it's colder outside, heat's moving from inside to outside. Forget about air transfer for a minute. Just think about heat is literally going right through the walls, right through the solid window glass from inside to outside. The bigger the difference in temperature between inside and outside, the faster that heat moves. And of course, the faster the house will cool off. The faster the heat moves from inside to outside, the faster our heating system has to replace that heat as it's being lost. So you can almost think of like your home or your building like a bucket with a hole in it. And the size of the hole gets bigger, the colder it is outside, which means that the faucet putting the water back in, that's our heating system, has to add heat at least as fast as it's draining out the bottom of the bucket. So that way you can kind of imagine heat being a quantity of a substance happening, moving over time. And it's always going to have that time frame. And as we move forward into talking about emitters, this temperature difference idea is always going to be important. And right now I want to lay a really important concept on you, and that is this concept of temperature difference. When we're measuring temperature, we always want to be measuring at least two temperatures. Simply knowing a temperature isn't very helpful unless we have something to compare it to. For example, if I know that the water coming out of the boiler is 180 degrees, well that's good to know but it's not nearly as valuable when I also know that the water coming into the boiler is 160 degrees, and more importantly, the difference between those two numbers is 20. That temperature difference is most important. Now I can also have a boiler that has a supply water temperature of 180 degrees, and a boiler that has a return water temperature of 176 degrees. This gives me a temperature difference of four. This means something very different to me than it does when the temperature difference is 20. This has a lot to do with the rate of heat transfer and the rate of heat exchange. And as we move forward in, the, in our course, I'll explain that concept in much greater detail. But for right now, I just want you to be aware that when, first of all, measuring temperatures is very, very important. When I'm working with technicians in the field and they're having challenges and I ask them what temperatures did they measure, very frequently they answer that they did not measure them. So this is very, very important. Yes, we need to be measuring temperatures and we need to be paying attention to temperature differences. And if that isn't, ex if you don't know exactly what I'm talking about, don't worry about it because uh, I will absolutely um, go through that as we get to that point in the course. Oh, there's my little dance. <laughs> there are three different types of heat transfer that exist. There's only three. There's convection, number one. Convection means that we're going to transfer heat using a liquid or a gas. And that sounds just like what we're doing in hydronics, doesn't it? Transferring heat using a liquid, and that's absolutely right. 
Transferring heat using a gas is also convection, and that would be uh, forced air systems. That they're both convection. Conduction, conduction, is the transfer of heat through a solid material. Heat will move through solid materials very, very well, and so we have a lot of conduction happening within our hydronic systems. And finally, the last type of heat transfer is radiation. Radiation is a little more difficult to really visualize than convection or conduction. Radiation means we're transferring heat without the use of a gas or a fluid or a solid. It is almost magical when you think about how radiation works. But heat will literally go through a substance like air, for example, and not change the substance that it passes through. And that's radiation. And the, the best analogy I can think of to radiation is if you ever had a campfire or a fireplace. The campfire is a little, uh, little, a little more fun, right? <laughs> Roasted marshmallows and all that stuff. So if you've ever been at a campfire, especially if it's been a little chilly in the evening, uh, you'll know that your front side, which is facing the fire, is nice and toasty warm. But your back side, which is not facing the fire, is quite a bit chillier. And in fact, if you're, uh, if you're having a little bit of a party situation and somebody gets a little rowdy and they get up and they start dancing around the fire, and if they happen to be standing in front of you, well, then your nice warm sensation immediately goes away. And what's happening there is that heat energy from the fire is transferred directly to you, but the airspace in between you and the fire is not heated at all. The air around you is not heated at all. It is a direct line of sight transfer of energy. This is the way the sun warms the earth by shining on it from space. And this is also the way radiators work in our hydronic heating systems. Uh, and it's, um, I encourage you next time you're in front of a fireplace or a radiator, or even a hot electric heater, you'll feel that heat coming off of that heating element. That is radiant heat transfer. So I want you to experiment with that and, and recognize radiant heat transfer. So um, as we uh, look at different systems that employ these different types of uh, methods of heat transfer, we're going to point them out and say this is what's being utilized in this case and in that case. Now in the field, in general, in service, this isn't something that you necessarily have to have in the forefront of your mind, but there are certain situ service situations where it does become important. So it's one of those foundational things that you just kind of have to know. So BTU is not the same thing as temperature. And this is a really crucial concept. We just went from really basic to really advanced in a couple of slides. BTU is not the same thing as temperature. Now, BTU and temperature are related to one another. Obviously, as we add heat energy to a substance, we're going to change its temperature. As we remove heat energy from a substance, we're going to change its temperature. But even so, we still need to kind of divorce the the connection between temperature and heat in our minds because we can transfer large quantities of heat energy without having high temperatures. And we can have high temperatures and still not be moving significant amounts of heat energy. When we're troubleshooting heating systems, we need to look for where is the heat energy moving and that is the important part of our heating system. Very frequently when technicians run into trouble around diagnosing heating systems, the reason why is it goes something like this. It says, hey, it's, it's really hot, therefore I shouldn't be having a problem. So the problem isn't the fact that it is or isn't hot. The fact is the problem is heat isn't moving in the right quantities. So just because something is hot doesn't necessarily mean it's an effective heating system. And so to illustrate that, I want to talk a little bit more about this whole idea of a BTU and, um, and the, the one degree for one pound and, and those kinds of things. Remember, heat is a unit of energy. It doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily related directly to temperature. So let's look into this. One gallon of water weighs 8.33 pounds. That's a pretty arbitrary number. But this is one of those numbers that I want you to commit to your memory because when we're doing hydronic heat transfer calculations, this number is going to be used over and over and over again. One gallon of water weighs 8.33 pounds. Why is this important to remember? It's because of this. We always measure water flow and water quantity in gallons, in volume. We always measure heat transfer in pounds, BTUs per pound. 
We don't do BTU per gallon, we do BTU per pound. So we always have to convert gallons into weight if we want to measure BTU transfer. So one gallon of water weighs 8.33 pounds. The specific heat of water is one, meaning it takes one BTU to raise one um, pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. That's the definition of a BTU. It's also the thing known as specific heat. So if I have 10 gallons of water, they're going to weigh 83.3 pounds. And let's imagine that I have this 10 gallons of water sitting at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and I want to add 1,000 BTU, 1,000 heat pellets, 1,000 heat passengers of heat energy to this water. I will experience an increase in temperature because one BTU will raise one pound of water one degree. Therefore, 1,000 BTU will raise 83.3 pounds of water, 12 degrees. And we do the math like this. 1,000 BTU, that's the amount of heat we added, divided into the pounds or the weight of water, 83.3 pounds, is 12. Therefore, 10 gallons of water will raise in temperature 12 degrees by adding 1,000 BTU. So now let's look at another vessel that has 20 gallons of water. The weight of 20 gallons of water is 166.6 pounds. This is double the water that we had before. And let's imagine further that our starting temperature is 70 degrees. Let's go ahead and add 1,000 BTU of heat to the 20 gallons of water. Our final temperature now is only going to be 76 degrees. It will not have increased in temperature nearly as much as the smaller volume of water did. The math, of course, works out this way. 1,000 BTU divided by 166.6 pounds equals 6. 20 gallons of water will raise in temperature 6 degrees with the addition of 1,000 BTU of heat energy. Now, before we thought about this, it wouldn't be uncommon for you to look at vessel A and see it's at 82 degrees and then look at vessel B and see it's at 76 degrees and make the assumption that vessel A has more heat energy or we added more heat energy to create that change. But here you can plainly see that the same amount of heat energy was added to each vessel but the temperatures aren't the same. The amount of mass involved has a lot to do with it. Another way we can think about this is Imagine a needle. If you put a needle, my mother used to do this when I was a kid and I'd get a sliver. She would sterilize a needle by putting it into the gas flame of a gas stove and it would get red hot. But it wouldn't stay hot very long. Now that red hot needle is probably, oh, what, 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's really, really hot. But it doesn't have a significant quantity of heat energy in it because there's not a lot of mass to that needle. It's a very small thing. It will change temperature pretty quickly, actually. You know, you put a little bit of heat on it, and it glows red hot, and then a couple seconds later, it's cool to the touch again because there's not a lot of actual heat there. Now, on the other hand, if we had, say, a, a chunk of rebar or, or a half-inch thick rod of steel, and it was red hot, well, that would be a lot more heat energy, right? In fact, there would probably be more heat energy in that uh, half-inch rod if it was 100 degrees compared to that needle at 1,000 degrees. So that's what I mean by BTU isn't the same thing as temperature. Well, temperatures are important, but they're not as important as the movement of heat. And as we move through this system, it is important to pay attention to our water temperature, but it's also important to place that into context. We're going to experience some heating systems that operate on very low water temperatures, but heat an entire home or building or garage very, very well in very cold weather. On the other hand, we're going to see other hydronic systems that use very high water temperatures. It all depends on the way that system is designed and the way that it is meant to function, and that relates to what type of boiler do we have, what type of distribution system do we have, what type of emitters do we have, before we can analyze whether or not our water temperatures are appropriate. So as we're investigating heating problems, bear this in mind, temperature is important, but it is secondary to the actual flow and movement of heat energy. And we're going to use the analysis of temperature to identify how well heat is moving from 
one part of the system to another part of the system to another part of the system. Let's take a minute and compare hydronic systems to air. Um, I came into hydronics from the forced air world, and I imagine a lot of other people do too. Uh, in fact, there's a lot more forced air systems out there than there are hydronic systems, which is why it kind of some, seems a little mysterious to some people. So the specific heat of water, like I said, is one. One BTU to raise one pound of water, one degree. The specific heat of air, by comparison, is only 0.17, which means that it doesn't take very much heat energy to raise the temperature of air very, very, much, very quickly or lower the temperature of air very quickly. One gallon of water weighs 8.33 pounds. A cubic foot of air, which is our standard measurement of air, is uh, 0.0807 pounds. Uh, this is why these two numbers are the way they are. Air and water, of course, is much more dense than air is. In order to transfer 50,000 BTU of heat energy at a standard delta T of 20 degrees, and when I say delta T, from now on, delta T means change in temperature. So at a delta T of 20 degrees, our water is changing temperature 20 degrees. We would need to use 40 cubic feet of water. We're going to have to move 40 cubic feet of water to move 50,000 BTU. If we're going to transfer 50,000 BTU in a delta T of 40 degrees for air, we would need 91,000 cubic feet of air. If that delta T was only 20 when it comes to air, we're probably talking closer to 180 or 200,000 cubic feet of air. Now for water, this means we're going to have a flow rate of 5 gallons per minute. We need to move 5 GPM to do that work. To do that same amount of work using air, we're going to be looking at, be looking at a flow rate of about 1,500 cubic feet per minute. Now, there is a lot of debate out there that I've heard over the years about what kind of heating system is superior to the other. Uh, which is better, hot water system or forced air system? Uh, some older uh, uh, hydronic heating technicians refer, they kind of look down on forced air systems and they call it scorched air and that that's bad. And they proudly refer to themselves as wet heads. And that's fine. However, uh, we need to be prepared to be able to work on everything, right? Everything that's out there. And I am going to propose the idea that hydronics versus forced air, they're not, they're one is not as superior to the other. But each one has specific pros and cons. They need to be understood and need to be taken into account by both system designers and heating technicians. Keep in mind the last thing that a customer wants to hear is that the heating system that their home is based around is somehow inferior to another heating system that is somehow superior. And in truth, that neither is superior to the other. That gets us back to the same old uh, you know, Ford versus Chevy argument, which is, really nonsensical. If you were to take the badges off and see which one drives down the street and delivers its payload, you know, they both do, of course. It takes almost 40 times as much air to do the same amount of heating work as water. And this fact brings us specific advantages to the hydronic side of things. Um, one of those advantages has to do with the fact that this amount of air will literally weigh three times more than the equivalent amount of water when it comes to heat transfer. So pound for pound, hydronic heating is more effective. Uh, we need to move a lot more air than we do need to move water. And that air actually weighs three times as much as the water does, which means it takes a lot more energy to move that air, to use fan energy. That's extreme. So now let's kind of do a, a pros and cons versus hydronics compared to forced air. One of, the, uh, one of the pros, hot water pipes are a lot smaller than air ducts, which makes them a lot easier to put into a building without having to make big chases and, and, and waste you know, valuable interior space to dedicated to forced air ducts. Instead, we can have much smaller pipes uh, to move the water through. Uh, because of what I just said earlier, less electricity required to pump water than to move the equivalent amount of air. There's an advantage there as well. Another advantage, hot water circulation is virtually silent. So people who don't like to hear the sound of that fan or don't like to hear air circulation, there's an advantage there. We don't have drafts associated with air movements in a hydronic system. A lot of people, and this is subjective of course, but a lot of people feel that hydronic systems deliver a higher degree of comfort. 
Another advantage of hydronic systems is it's really easy to zone them. It's really easy to balance to create more even temperatures through a structure or to individually tailor temperature settings to different areas of the house or building. We have a lot more flexibility in where we locate the boiler versus where we locate the air handler. Uh, on a forced air system, the air handler is preferred to be smack dab in the middle of the building or structure. And that's not always easy to do. And uh, sometimes when we have to put the, the air handler on one end or the other of the building, it leads to other problems. Uh, boiler, on the other hand, doesn't even have to be in the same building. <laughs> it can be down the block. And uh, there, there are systems like that where an entire campus will be heated by a boiler plant located in some other building. And it will literally pump the heated water to the different buildings as necessary. We call that a, a district heating system. So we can really put the boiler just about anywhere. In general, boilers last longer than forced air furnaces. So a lot of folks think of that as an advantage. So let's look at some of the disadvantages, though. There are some, and we need to be aware of them as technicians. Number one, water systems have a very strong tendency to leak. As long as humans have been trying to manage water and trying to keep water in one place, water has been trying to go somewhere else. It has been the never-ending struggle of humankind to keep water put. Whether it be a dam, whether it be a canal, or river, or a tank, ultimately water is going to make up its own mind and do what it wants to do, not necessarily what we want to do. So as a result, water has a tendency to leak. If we have an air leak, eh, no problem. If we have a water leak, you have a big problem. And damage is occurring in finished construction, and, and you get the idea. Also, operational costs may be higher. One of the advantages of the hydronic system being that it's water-based, and being that water is denser than air, and because of the fact that heat moves from warmer area to cooler area, well, and the difference in temperature dictates the speed at which heat will move, well, this means a few things. Number one, we have to generate a difference in temperature between our water and the thing that we want to heat in order to get that heat to move. And because water is more dense, it takes more energy just to get that process started. So as a result, operational costs may be higher because to create that energy difference, we have to burn the fuel or use the electricity or whatever our fuel source is, and that costs money. You can't immediately put air conditioning onto a hydronic-only system because air conditioning, by its very name, we need air. We need air ducts. Uh, so that's a bit of a disadvantage. If you want to have a home that has both hydronic heating system and air conditioning, you're going to have two completely independent distribution systems. And that leads to higher installation costs. To go along with that, indoor air quality products like air filtration, humidification, um, ventilation, uh, the, they don't exist alongside or within a hydronic system. They have to be added to the building separately with their own, like I said, duct system, fan system, and all of that. Also, no fresh air exchange. Much higher cost of installation comparing hydronic heating to forced air. As a result, in luxury homes, especially in cold weather climates, we're getting a lot of hydronics because it is high end and that breeds even more complexity. We get a lot of really complicated, really neat systems in some of these high-end homes. Here in Colorado, up in the mountains, in places like Vail and Aspen, uh, we get a lot of that uh, interesting stuff. In general, there's more components to a hydronic system, and this means more potential for failure, lots more stuff to go wrong. And as a mechanic, you know that's what keeps you uh, having food on the table, right? Is things breaking, you going on and fixing them. Another disadvantage of hydronic systems is that it takes much longer to change temperatures. With forced air, if you kick the thermostat on, you know, and it's, say, um, 60 and you want to get up to 70, uh, that can happen maybe in 15, 20 minutes or so, right? Well, hi uh, for hydronics, it could be hours before that temp temperature change is realized. Uh, so things change much more slowly, both warming up and cooling down. So if you're used to doing that setback uh, nighttime temperature setting with forced air and having the house cool down fairly quickly in hydronics it's going to it may take a while longer especially if we're dealing with a radiant system so that covers our kind of pros and cons between um, forced air versus uh, hydronics and as you can see there's really no clear winner 
there's advantages to the one and disadvantages to the one on both sides. So uh, you just need to be aware of what the limitations are and what the characteristics are. That's it. When we're talking about basics, there's only four parts to every hydronic system. And I like to break everything down to as simple as it can possibly be, right? You probably picked up on that when I told you about the water bottle. When we have an active hydronic system, there's really only four parts to it. As complicated as all these systems can be, it always breaks down to there's still only four parts. And for uh, those of you who don't have a whole lot of boiler experience, this can be a really big source of relief. You know, ah, there's only four things to worry about. <laughs> now, of course, the devil's in the details, and those four things can manifest in many ways, but here's what they are. Number one, we need some kind of a vessel to hold the water and to transfer heat from the heat source into the water. Next, we need some way to move that heated water, and that should be a D right there. I just now realized that that's an R for all these years. We need to have some way to move that heated water from the vessel to the place where that heat is wanted. Next, we have to have some way to transfer that heat from the water into the actual place that heat is wanted, right? Like the room. And finally, we need to have some way to control the whole system. Now, this is a pretty broad definition. There's lots of different ways we can assemble these four components to create and activate hydronic heating system. Most of the time, here's what that means. We're going to have our number one is going to turn into a boiler. That's the vessel that transfers heat from the heat source, such as a gas flame, oil flame, coal flame, wood flame, uh, into the water. That's the boiler. Some means of moving that water out of the vessel and into some place, that is called our piping and pumping system. There's a number, another name for that that I want you to write down, and that is distribution. Distribution. Piping and pumping systems, also known as distribution system. Next, we have to have some way to get that heat out of the water into the place where we want it, and that is the emitters. And finally, something to control the whole system, and that is usually our electronic controls. Now, back in the olden days, those would be manual controls, but today, most of them were electromechanical and even electronic. All righty. Now we're going to get into the different types of boilers. The first type of boiler we're going to talk about is probably my favorite type of boiler. It is the cast iron sectional boiler. It is called cast iron sectional because it's made of sections that are made of cast iron, cast iron. Each section is hollow. And here we see four sections kind of side by side. And you can imagine that these are going to come together. And we're going to form waterways. Each section is hollow. And so water will enter on one side. It will flow through the hollow section and exit on the other side. Meanwhile, the flame would be burning underneath, and the hot gases, the products of combustion, the flue gases, are going to be circulating up along the outside of this heat exchanger, or boiler section. Cast iron sectional boilers really aren't a whole much to look at. They look like just a boring sheet metal box, and here is, here is a pretty standard-looking cast iron sectional boiler. Cast iron sectionals are the oldest type of boiler uh, that has ever been out there. They were the one of the first ones created. The very, very first boiler was actually made of pipes uh, welded together. And then the very follow shortly after that, they came up with the casting technology to build these cast iron boilers. And we're talking back in the 1800s is when these boilers were developed. We still have cast iron sectional boilers being made today. Uh, and they are really not significantly different than they were then. They are a little bit more advanced in terms of their design and their ability to transfer heat effectively, and they really are effective. Uh, they're really, really great at what they do, and they last literally forever because they're just a big hunk of steel, essentially, is what they are. Let's look at some, uh, some of the old ones. Here's a, what we call uh, the Britannia boiler. Uh, these are really old. These are coal-fired, by the way. These are old. And you still see boiler sections, and you see them all, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about ten of them, you can see they're bolted together. There's a draw rod right there, bolting all these sections together. There's another draw rod there, and there's a third one down here in the corner. 
and uh, a fourth one up here on the top. And this is basically squeezing all those sections together so that the waterways remain watertight. You could have bought it with a jacket or without a jacket. Nowadays, you still see boilers like this. And in some cases, you may see them uh, completely covered in a white material. That's asbestos, totally wrapped in asbestos, because the original installers were like, heck, I'm not paying the extra money for a metal jacket. I'll just wrap the thing in asbestos. And that's the way a lot of them got done. You'll still see these old doors. Um, one really neat thing to notice here is this was a um, coal-fired boiler. And the way that they would regulate the heat is with this linkage right here that would be attached to uh, a temperature sensing element in the water. And it would open and close the uh, a burner damper to choke off the air or open it up. Pretty neat stuff. Uh, of course, you probably aren't going to find a coal-fired boiler anymore, but you may still find this exact same boiler that has since been converted to burn natural gas instead, or one very similar to it. Here's another cast iron sectional, uh, probably manufactured in the 1960s or 1970s, and this one is on its way to be replaced. A couple of things to notice here. Uh, notice the very old-fashioned gas train, but most importantly, look at the sections. There's an end section that comes down to the ground, which is part of the foot that the whole boiler sits on. And then on the other side, there's another one like that with a foot that the whole thing sets on. And in the middle are one, two, three, four, five sections all the same. So I got one left-hand section, one right-hand section, and five middle sections that are all the same. When the manufacturer designed and built this boiler, they offered this boiler in multiple sizes, multiple BTU ratings. So this boiler may have been available anywhere from, say, 75,000 BTU up to maybe 150 or 250,000 BTU. The only difference is between the smaller size boiler and the larger size boiler is the number of sections that it is made out of. So this boiler here would be a one, two, three, four, five, six or seven section boiler. A smaller boiler may only have had four or five sections. A larger boiler may have 10 or 12 sections. So the number of sections that are built, uh, bolted together, really dictates the heating capacity of that boiler. Notice underneath the boiler is where the burners are, and they will burn upwards. And uh, remember from that previous picture with the uh, red boiler on it, let me show you that again. Here we are. Uh, that those uh, flames and products of combustion would go right up in between the sections and come out the top. At the top, there's a big metal box literally bolted down and sealed with a, a special sealer called pyro seal or, or furnace cement. And this is where all those uh, flue gases would accumulate to connect to the common flue, which would attach to the top of this. One thing I want you to pay attention to on this old cast iron boiler is very likely there's nothing wrong with it. It's probably not leaking, water at least. But where these section seals are, there is a type of a putty applied there, also around here. And by this age, that putty has largely dried out and flaked away and fallen down. As a result, products of combustion have the ability to leak out. And when you're checking one of these boilers, it's very crucial that you're checking for carbon monoxide and check in every penetration, like where this control penetrates through the jacket and into the boiler section, where this pipe penetrates through the jacket. Look for any signs of combustible or uh, combustion products there. Look for carbon monoxide. If you're having a combustion analyzer, look for carbon dioxide. That is an indicator that your heat exchanger is leaking uh, because these seals have failed. That's a really good time to think about a new boiler. It is possible to tear this cast iron boiler down and reseal that heat exchanger, um, but that's not something I would that would be my first choice because this thing is old enough. Now, a second thing to think about these old boilers. Here's a old patent diagram from a cast iron section. One of the problems that uh, old cast iron boilers can experience is an accumulation of sludge down in the bottom of the heat exchanger sections. Like say it might be, there's 
by line. I'll, I'll draw a little line on the bottom there. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a little line right there. It's almost like a mud. And you'll know that your cast iron boiler is sludged up when you fire it up. And as it starts warming up, it starts to sound like a popcorn popper. Literally. It sounds like it's popping. What's happening when it's popping is this layer of mud in the bottom. Uh, it doesn't transfer heat very well into the water. So we've got the flame happening down here. And as, it, as a result, the mud in the bottom of the boiler begins to actually boil. Now this brings us to one of the really important things about hot water heating systems is they're not supposed to actually boil. All of our hydronic heating systems are operated at less than boiling temperatures, which makes the term boiler kind of a misnomer. Originally, boilers were all steam boilers, and they did boil. But then somebody got the bright idea and says, hey, maybe we don't necessarily need steam. Maybe we just circulate warm water. That'll work better and or work just as well. And the hot water boiler was developed. And that's what we're talking about here is hot water boilers. When that steam begins to boil, little steam pockets will erupt suddenly out of that mud into the water. And that's what's creating the popping sound. Now that isn't necessarily a hazard. It's not dangerous necessarily. But instead what is a problem is that it's not really giving a very effective transfer of heat into the water. Um, that mud is kind of like an insulating layer down at the bottom. Now there's plenty of heat transfer happening up here, but this whole boiler now is going to be very energy inefficient. It's going to be an energy hog. It's going to be very poor operation. And there is absolutely no way to get that mud out of there. It's, it's a problem. As we'll learn later, uh, steel and iron in a boiler system is not a problem. We can have that for 100 years and it'll never rust inside. When we get that sludge and rust, it's usually because there's been some air in the system, some dissolved oxygen in the system. We'll talk about that next week. But be aware that's the cause of that and that there's no fixing to it. And that is also a really good time to start thinking about a new boiler. And when we do think about a new boiler, there's nothing wrong with going back with a cast iron boiler again, except for the fact that if you're the person who has to haul it down the stairs, you might want to go with a lighter weight option. Here's another example of the cast iron heat exchanger. And this is from a, a brand new modern era boiler. You see the multiple sections bolted together. They set upon a base now. Instead of having the legs that sit down, there's a metal base made for the heat exchanger with a gasket in between. Burners down below. A collector, flue collector box bolted to the top. Boy, that is pretty much the same thing as this, isn't it? That's right, which is pretty much the same thing as this. Um, old technology. Here's some commercial sections. These are very large um, commercial cast iron boilers. Brand new one going in right here. And here you see all the different sections all lined up in a row. In this case the burner is going to shoot in horizontally on this, on this one. This could be either oil or gas. Don't know yet. Don't see the burner set up. These yellow pipes maybe think it might be gas. And you can see the draw rod bolting the whole thing together. These are sections waiting to be installed. And I'll tell you, these are not small. They're not lightweight. Each one of these weighs probably around 400 to 500 pounds each. Which is why boiler men are generally pretty burly guys if they're uh, in the process of putting those things together. To review cast iron uh, sectional boilers, uh, are some of their identifying traits is they last forever. They last a very, very long time. As a result, they're also really heavy. Uh, they can be used either in a steam application or a hot water application. In fact, in most cases, the only difference between a steam boiler and a hot water boiler is the steam boiler isn't full up to the water all the way, and the hot water boiler is. Uh, also, there's going to be some additional accessories to make it a steam boiler versus a hot water boiler. But the sections, the cast iron, is the same deal. Now, this one right here that we looked at is a hot water boiler. And it's gone through some changes over the years. It's, got a, it's wearing a new pump right here. I see some new pieces of pipe here for some reason. Uh, you can see these section, this section here looks a little older than uh, this section here does. Uh, brand new modern ball valve. So there's been some repairs on this system over the years. 
One thing to notice, like I mentioned at the beginning of our class, the more you look at boilers, the more you'll find things that just aren't quite right. Here's a good example of that. There's a drip leg, a dirt leg, on the supply pipe leaving the boiler. And there's not a really good reason for that to be there. It has, serves no functional purpose. Um, no one is ever going to pull that out and clean it. There shouldn't be any dirt leaving the boiler that you would want to accumulate. If you ever wanted to keep dirt out of the boiler, you would have to have that over here on the inlet side. But no, this is the supply side. This is the water leaving side. And there's a dirt leg there. It's just one of those interesting things that kind of make you go, hmm. And you're going to see these. The more you look, the more you're going to find them. Uh, additional sections are bolted together to make the boiler simply longer or wider, depending on your perspective, for larger sizes. All cast iron boilers, with one notable exception, are what we call non-condensing applications. This means they need to have return water temperatures higher than 140 degrees Fahrenheit. If we are dealing, uh, regardless of what fuel we're dealing with, uh, 130 degrees is approximately the condensing point of the water vapor component of products of combustion. And we do not want to have the surfaces of our cast iron boiler accumulating water vapor on them. And that will happen if we're constantly flowing cold water into the boiler. So cast iron boilers need to live in an environment, they need to be designed so that the water coming back from the system is greater than 140 degrees. And if it's not going to be greater than 140 degrees, special um, special considerations need to be taken. Uh, cast iron sectional boilers may be natural draft with atmospheric burners, or they may have power gas burners or oil burners or coal or some other fuel. Some cast iron boilers have extra heat exchangers, and this is meant to increase their annual fuel utilization efficiency up to about 85%. And on our next page is a picture of one of those extra heat exchangers. This is the top looking down with the flue collar removed on a Weill McLean um, HE series boiler, high efficiency. And that took their standard cast iron heat exchanger, put an additional heat exchanger on top of it to extract even more heat out of the flue gases, and this one will run at about 85% uh, efficiency. The next boiler we're going to discuss is called the copper fin tube boiler. Copper fin tube boilers are much smaller than cast iron boilers. Uh, this boiler right here is really about the size of a big lunchbox if you're a big person. You could probably pick this up with one hand and walk around with it. I'm exaggerating, of course. This is probably about oh, uh, two feet wide by um, two feet wide by maybe two and a half feet deep by maybe two and a half feet tall. It's really not physically large. It's this boiler that we're looking at right now is probably going to do the same heating job as this boiler here, which is much, much larger. Uh, so copper fin boilers pack a large punch into a small space. Be, you can tell by their name that they are made out of copper, and I'll show you one of the heat exchangers. Uh, you can buy copper fin boilers for multiple applications. They can be for space heating. They can be dedicated for domestic water heating. They can be dedicated for pool heating. They can be located indoors, or they can be located outdoors. A lot of flexibility. Here we have some indoor installation Raypack uh, copper fin tube boilers. These happen to be natural draft gas boilers. Here's the draft hood and the, the flue on top. On the LARS in the previous page, the draft inverter is in the back. This one is a outdoor uh, mounted boiler, and it has um, no flue on it whatsoever, just vents to the atmosphere. Now there's something that I just realized that I forgot to mention that we need to cover right away. One of the defining factors of a cast iron boiler is this. Water enters, and I want you to flip back a couple of pages here. Water always enters the boiler at the lower level and always leaves at the higher level. And this is related to identifying which direction the water moves. Water enters low and leaves high. That could mean that, um, so for example, here we have 
one connection down here and the supply connection is on the top I think of this boiler or it's around the side near the top. This would be the lower, this would be water entering, the other would be water leaving. This is an important part of identifying which direction the water moves in your system. So on cast iron boilers, water always in on the bottom, leaving on the top. And you can see the way the heat exchanger is designed. Water in on the bottom, leaving on the top. And on this old one, water in on the bottom, leaving on the top. On this old one, in on the bottom, leaving on the top. And these old ones uh, here as well, in on the bottom, leaving on the top. I said old, I mean those are brand new. <laughs> Copper fin tube boilers don't have that same thing going on. One of the defining factors of, a, or defining features, I should say, of a copper fin tube boiler is the water enters and leaves at the same physical level. For example, these we have water entering and leaving both on the top side. On this one, we have water entering and leaving both on the side side at the same level, entering, leaving, or this could be entering and leaving. It's a little harder to tell which one's the entering and which one's the leaving on a copper fin tube boiler. This is a commercial copper fin tube boiler. And copper fin tube boilers get up in size to, I think they top out right around 2.7 million BTU input. Um, here again, entering and leaving at the same plane. And that heat exchanger is just pretty long. Lots of burners underneath it. There's the heat exchanger in the middle. Here's a cutaway from, I think this is an RBI. There's a heat exchanger with all of the burners underneath it. The copper fin tube boiler gets its name from that heat exchanger, which is really a copper tube with copper fins on the tube and a bunch of them. This is the heat exchanger right here. That's it. You can't get a whole lot more simple than that. It is a copper fin tube boiler. Now this one actually has a problem. Notice that it looks kind of green over here in the corner and kind of white in the rest of the place. This is an example of a boiler operating for extended periods with cool or cold return water temperature. Water temperatures less than 140 degrees are going to lead to flue gases condensing on the boiler heat exchanger surfaces, leaving behind these deposits. Could ultimately even lead to heat exchanger failure. As a result, these uh, heat exchangers, the passageways between the fins are very narrow. They begin to get even smaller and narrower because of these deposits left behind by that condensation. And that leads to blocked flue passageways, poor draft, suited heat exchangers, trip rollouts, things starting on fire, all kinds of bad ideas. So I wanted to kind of point out, A, this is a copper fin heat exchanger. B, the copper fin boilers are supposed to be non-condensing. It's very common that they will be condensing and that will lead to damage. We have commercial styles, another commercial style of um, copper fin boiler. This is called A.O. Smith Burke. It is unusual in that instead of the copper fins, uh, copper tubes laying in a horizontal plane, they're actually wrapped around in a coil with one giant, like almost like big water heater style burner in the middle. I call it the Olympic torch burner, the big round thing with the flames that come up like this. And on these, these are probably in the 400 to 500,000 BTU neighborhood. So this boiler has this burner uh, coming down here and the, the products of combustion have to pass horizontally through the copper fins as they're wound around and around and to get up and into the flue. You look at this boiler and you think, man, that thing looks like a disaster. There's just wires and just stuff everywhere. Somebody kind of really didn't do a good job on that. No, that's the way they are. <laughs> when you buy one of these, this is all you get. And all this other stuff had to be field installed by the original installer. So all the wiring had to be done, all the accessories had to be installed by whomever used their creative mind to decide how to put that together. Some of the uh, notable features of the copper fin tube boiler are, number one, they are very low mass, which offers very fast recovery. They can heat up up to temperature very quickly because the actual, uh, you know, material they're made of, there's not a whole lot to them. Um, they're generally hot water applications only, no steam. 
on a copper fin tube boiler. Also, no oil, no solid fuel. Natural gas only on copper fin tube boilers. They're often used in applications where flue gas condensation is likely under certain conditions, but they're not meant to operate in a condensing fashion permanently. Uh, doing so is going to cause damage. Now, some examples where condensation could be likely, especially on light off, would be as a domestic water heater or as a pool heater or any other application where cold starts are likely. And they're, they're good in that application because the, the copper itself won't actually just corrode unless we let things get away from us and run them condensing all the time. Otherwise, they're used in the same applications as cast iron boilers are. In fact, we could go ahead and take that big, heavy, old cast iron boiler out and put in a properly sized copper fin tube boiler, and that system would be happy for a very long time. And that's a way a lot of uh, companies like to go, is to pull out the cast iron, go back with the copper fin tube, um, because they're so much lighter and easier to place and easier to fit into a space. And they take less time, because you don't have to put them together like a lot of the cast iron sectionals have to be put together. Uh, because of this condensation issue, they're often piped with a bypass. In fact, uh, almost all copper fin tube boilers, if you read the installation instructions very carefully, must have a bypass installed. And this is one of the problems that you'll experience. Like notice this boiler here, uh, it doesn't have a bypass. These rate packs, they realize, hey, people aren't putting bypasses on our boilers, so they built one from the factory. That's what this is. It's a bypass. We'll talk more about bypasses later, but I just want you to be aware that copper fin tube boilers, by and large, are supposed to have bypasses between supply and return. They're very lightweight, they have a very small footprint, and they're a really good choice to replace cast iron boilers. They're generally smaller in size, and usually they're natural draft with atmospheric burners. A larger commercial sizes may have some type of a sealed uh, combustion or forced draft arrangement going on. And, um, but that's only going to be in the larger sizes. Okay, so right now we are about halfway through our boiler uh, section of what kind of boilers we're going to look at. And this is a good time to take a break. Okie dokie, welcome back from break, everybody. And we were in the middle of talking about copper fin tube boilers. And in keeping with uh, what we discussed earlier as far as identifying what kind of boiler you have and um, what direction the water is moving, the copper fin tube boiler is a little more difficult to identify which direction the water is moving. Now when they come from the factory, there's a label. One side says supply, one side says return. But by the time you get there, that label may be gone or corroded or burned off by a torch or who knows what happened to it. Um, different brands are going to have different nomenclature, and it's a little more difficult to identify which direction the water moves because, because um, they're in the same plane. So one convenient thing that you can look for in those applications is where is the boiler measuring its temperature? Where is it sensing temperature? And in this boiler, you can see there is a pressure and temperature gauge, and it's right next to this pipe. So that would indicate that this would be the supply, because boilers always want to be measuring the hottest water in the boiler. And um, so that would be the supply side, the hottest water. So the temperature sensing element is always going to be on the supply side of the boiler. So that is one kind of dead giveaway that you can kind of help figure out which direction the water is moving. If you can't read any of the labels and um, or it's just too dark to see or, or for whatever reason. So that's kind of one little trick that you can use. Now that doesn't always necessarily <laughs> mean it's always easy. Sometimes you have to look carefully uh, to figure that out. Now one additional thing, we'll talk more about this when we talk about circulator pumps, but I want to come back to this, is uh, the there's always a hump on the pump, and the hump is in the direction of water flow. A lot of pumps will even have an arrow stamped on them, which may or may not be there, or may be visible or may not be visible. But if you can feel for where the pump is, here you can see also the water is leaving and moving in this direction to enter the pump. And when we talk about pumps, we'll talk about that in greater detail. But um, here you can see the hump on the pump is moving in this direction, and that's a factory installed pump. So water is flowing in here and out that way. 
These are a little bit more difficult to tell. We'd actually have to get right up close to it to figure that out. And this one, uh, there again, we're probably going to be looking for a pump because it's, it's just who knows what they did on that one. The next kind of boiler we're going to talk about is called the water tube boiler. Water tube is just like its name. It has water running through tubes. This is one of the oldest types of boilers uh, ever made. They last forever, and they're really consisted of a bunch of horizontal tubes with a big old fire below them. Uh, these can be fired on gas or they can be fired on oil. Mostly gas. Oil is much less common on these, but they are they do exist. So you can see down here, big old fire chamber, big old place for burners and flame and tubes with water running through it. That's all there is to it. Dead simple. They last forever and they're even repairable. Most of the time when you run into one of these boilers, you're going to notice that there is the same length as the boiler plus a little bit, either in the front of the boiler or in the behind of the boiler. At least they're supposed to be. And that is so that these tubes can be literally pulled out and cut out and then new tubes slid in place and welded in or pressed in, depending on the style of the boiler. So they can be repaired versus being uh, replaced. As a result, you're gonna find some very old time water tube boilers existing out there in the field. And um, I've even seen some before with this massive sea of burners underneath them. Imagine, uh, uh, here's a, uh, uh, let's see, actually this one would have the sea of burners underneath it. You can't see where the burners are, but imagine this entire floor covered with burners being monitored by a single standing pilot. And uh, that can be a little frightening as far as safety goes. And, and that's true. But uh, also be aware that if one of these tubes springs a leak, they can be plugged. So that doesn't mean that we have to stop everything, drain the system, and fix or replace that boiler now. Those tubes can actually be plugged and then let the thing run back through the heating season and deal with it in the spring or something along those lines. Now because of that, you may have a boiler that has a significant number of tubes plugged, and that can be a problem. One of the easiest ways to identify that you have a water tube boiler is because of there's this great big plate up at the top, and that is covering over the water tube inlets and outlets. And there's another one just like it on the back side from the other side of the boiler. These are larger boilers, as you can tell. And uh, look at this one. This one has two gigantic 24-inch uh, flues coming off the top of it. So that is not a small amount of BTUs going there. You've got three independent diaphragm gas valves plus one large main fluid power valve, a whole uh, redundant gas train going here. Pretty big deal. Um, which direction is the water moving? We can see we got a cover over that big plate here, but that's what identifies this as a water tube boiler. There's a water connection in the front and a water connection in the back. This would be the manifolds. But look here, there are four temperature sensors all in a row and they all sense here. So this end would be water supply. Water is leaving the boiler in this direction, entering at the backside, one pass through and out. So that is how this boiler would be operated. And that's how you can identify any water tube boiler. There's not a whole lot of different brands out there, and one of them is actually Acme, just like Wiley Coyote's Acme. Here's another cutaway shot of a water tube boiler. Uh, this one has a power burner, which shoots a big flame in. Pretty simple. Heats the water as it passes through these tubes. Here's that big header I was talking about. And there's all these bolts all along the outside of it with a gasket in between. Water tube boilers are used primarily in large applications. Sizes range from start, the small end is 450,000 BTU, and they top out at several million BTU per hour. They are incredibly durable, very long lasting, and the water tubes can be replaced. Um, changing out a water tube boiler isn't something that happens every day. It's more likely they're going to be replaced. And when a, be aware too that when a water tube boiler gets replaced, very frequently another brand new water tube boiler is going to go into that same application. Water tube boilers are chosen because often the applications that they're in demands that kind of boiler. So if you're looking for greater efficiencies, uh, you may be out of luck. Um, 
water tube boilers are not very energy efficient because I mean, you can see most energy efficient designs have very small passageways. Uh, here we have relatively large tubes, right? Um, they're not rifled, they're just smooth, plain steel. We don't have fins on the edges of the tubes to expand the surface area or anything like that. They're not super energy efficient. Uh, but one of their advantages is that they can be used in high pressure applications. This means tall buildings where the boiler is in the basement, for example. Uh, this also means any other unusual application where we need higher than normal water pressure in the boiler system. Up to 125 PSI, these boilers can withstand. The cast iron boilers that we looked at before, they generally have a maximum working pressure of 30 PSI, sometimes 50 PSI. Same thing on the copper fin tubes. Generally, those are, have a maximum pressure of 30 PSI. But here on the water tube boilers, we can tolerate much higher pressures if the application demands it. That being said, if you're looking at a um, water tube boiler for the first time, take a peek at the pressure gauge and be aware what kind of pressure you're looking at in the system. High pressure water can be very dangerous. We're frequently going to find water tube boilers used in harsh environments where um, we may have contaminated combustion air, for example, or chemicals are being used in the vicinity of the boiler because these thick metal tubes, they can tolerate that. They can handle it without being rusted through. Uh, we're also going to use them in high volume water heating applications, sometimes like um, laundries, um, commercial laundries, uh, commercial car washes, large hotels with lots of domestic water usage, uh, older mid-rise buildings. We're talking buildings built like prior to 1970 um, is where we're going to see a lot of these. Well, they even make them outdoor models and mount them on the roofs of buildings, um, which is kind of cool. You're like, hey, where's the boiler? It's on the roof. I'm like, what? Yeah, that was probably going to be a water tube boiler up there. They can be natural draft with atmospheric gas burners or with a power burner. Uh, and I say here, they're not used with oil. And I told you earlier they are. After I wrote this slide, I suddenly discovered there are a couple of oil-fired water tube boilers out there. So like I said at the beginning, there's no stopping of the learning in this trade. The next boiler we're going to talk about is called the fire tube boiler. Uh, the other one was a water tube boiler because it had water running through tubes. And guess what this one has? Um, fire running through tubes, also known as tube in shell. They look kind of look like a giant coffee can tipped over on its side, and they are giant. This gentleman here is standing next to, I would say, a medium-sized fire tube boiler. And yes, they are big. Uh, you're going to need a ladder if you want to reach up to the top of one. <coughs> Excuse me. Fire tube boilers consist of a metal shell is round, which is filled with water, they have a bunch of tubes running through that water space carrying both the flame and the resulting products of combustion and allowing the heat to transfer through the walls of those steel tubes into the water that is surrounding them. And of course the water is circulating through, uh, coming in one side and leaving the other. So here's a cutaway diagram of a typical fire tube boiler. We see a power burner here shooting into a horizontal flame. This could be gas, this could be oil. This could also be a dual fuel type of burner that can utilize either gas or oil. And so fire goes in this way, runs into the back wall, takes a turn, and now we're talking strictly combustion products because the flame is only maybe two or three feet long. The rest of it is all hot gases from the combustion process moving through all of these different tubes. Comes back into the front, takes another turn out this way, and eventually makes its way out the flue. So that's a shell and tube or fire tube boiler. Here's another example of what one would kind of look at from the side. Uh, fire coming in here, going through the tubes, going through the tubes, up the flue. Meanwhile, there's water all around. Shell and tube boilers can be uh, steam or they can be hot water. If they're steam, they're not going to be full all the way to the top. There's going to be space in the top for steam generation. Uh, if you are a steam boiler, you are going to have a sight glass along the side. And here we have some of that sight glass apparatus that's a little hard to see because it's partially hidden by the controls. But this looks like this could be a steam boiler. 
hot water boiler is not going to have a sight glass on the side because it's all the way full of water. Now, shell and tube boilers have doors on the front and on the back. And in this one, we have the back door open. And I want to caution you, if you are new to looking at these kinds of boilers, uh, avoid the temptation to open one and look inside for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, every one of these doors has a gasket surrounding it. And the gasket is made, it's called a rope gasket. It looks just like a rope. And it's made of a material called koa wool. And koa wool is the modern replacement for asbestos. It does not burn. It withstands very, very high temperatures, and that's why it's used as the gasket on the fire side of the boiler. When you open this door, you are committed almost 99% of the time to replacing that gasket. And if you don't have one with you, you are you suddenly created a major problem by opening that door. So be aware, anytime you're going to open the door on a uh, fire tube boiler, you're going to have to replace the rope gasket. So plan ahead. If you don't know what size gasket it takes, open it first, take it out, go get a gasket, and then come back. If it is late in the day and you don't have time to make that trip back and forth, don't open the door. Um, don't open it just to see what's in there. This is what's in there. This is our first pass of where the fire comes through. You can see the refractory material here has been kind of patched up over time over the years. It hits that refractory, turns around, goes through these tubes, hits the refractory on the front side, turns back around, comes through these tubes, and the flue is uh, located back there somewhere. I can't see it in this picture. Uh, but that's a shell and tube or fire tube boiler. Some of the features of fire tube boilers is that they're very large. They start off at 1.5 million BTU on the small end and they get up into the several hundreds of millions of BTUs. They are going to be used in low pressure applications and or in very high pressure applications, up to 300 PSI water. Now, very high pressure applications are going to be used in things like high rise buildings, district heating systems, campuses, uh, entire downtown areas, um, and they're very dangerous. So. For your average HVAC heating commercial residential technician needs to stay away from high pressure systems. They're a different animal. Even though the same essential boiler can be used in low pressure applications or in high pressure applications, when it's high pressure, it is a very, very dangerous animal. And we're talking about very extreme amounts of energy being circulated through this high pressure water system. High pressure water can be exist as water and not steam at very, very, very high temperatures into the hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit. Now, normally when water boils on your stove pot at home, 212 degrees or lower is the boiling temperature of water. When we get that water under pressure, especially very high pressure, we can have water uh, temperatures of 300, 400 or more degrees Fahrenheit and still be water. Now in the event that we were to just casually open a valve to take a water sample. As soon as that 300 plus degree water hits the atmosphere, it's going to be an explosion of energy. That water is going to immediately burst into steam and it's going to fill the entire room and literally boil everything alive in that room. It can be very dangerous. So my, my bottom line is, line is if you are accidentally called out to a high pressure application and you walk in the boiler room, walk yourself right back out again. Um, there's a whole other series of uh, certifications, uh, stationary engineer licenses, and boiler operators licenses that are necessary to work on those systems. So just be aware of that. Pay attention to what your pressure is uh, before you get in over your head. Um, and they generally feature power burners that can be set up for almost any type of fuel gas or liquid fuel. The next boiler we're going to talk about is called the ModCon boiler. This is another one of my favorites. This is the modern invention. Mod, in this case, does not stand for modern. It stands for modulating. Modulating slash condensing boilers. If you're familiar with high-efficiency furnaces that have AFUE ratings above 90%, condensing gas furnaces, this is the boiler version of that, but it's even more deluxe, and it's even more high-tech. 
These are fully modulating where they can almost like have an accelerator pedal to deliver the right amount of BTUs based on what the situation calls for at the time. So they're able to deal with changing load conditions, whether that means that different parts of the building are calling for heat or whether it means that it's warmer one day and colder the next day. Uh, all of those things are taken into account by the ModCon boiler. So in this picture, the ModCon boiler is this little critter right here in black. That small little thing. To have a ModCon boiler hanging on the wall is pretty common. In fact, most of them are wall hanging applications. You can install a ModCon boiler on a stand so that it can set on the ground, but you'll have to order that stand separately. It's an accessory or build it yourself. ModCon boilers, by and large, are designed to mount on the wall. There are a small handful of large commercial sized modulating condensing boilers that do this set on the floor, uh, but they're going to be greater than 400,000 BTU per hour. So anything under 400,000 BTU per hour is generally going to be wall mounted. Another feature of ModCon boilers is that they, they use a PVC flue and most of them are direct vent, meaning they have a dedicated combustion air intake coming from the outdoors to feed the burner and a dedicated exhaust going back to the outdoors. And you can see the PVC fluid intake assembly here on this boiler. Uh, ModCon boiler systems can become very complicated. And this one is relatively simple, but you can see that there is a whole lot of stuff going on here. And as we move through the rest of our course, we will discuss in great detail what all of this stuff is. Because when it comes to identifying which way the water goes in one of these boilers, uh, that can be a challenge. You're going to be looking for the pipe connections to see supply and return. And looking at the circulator pumps is usually the best way to go. Because in a system like this, water is going in all kinds of different directions. And uh, one of the skills that you'll learn through going through this course is how to identify uh, how to look at something like this and break it up into sections. So just real quick, we've got uh, one section right here. We've got another section right here. And we've got one section here and another section here. So that gives us one, two, three, four different water movement systems all in one location. And uh, we're just going to touch on ModCon boilers right now. At the end of our, our course in Section 6, we're going to deal with these systems a little bit more heavily. Uh, so modulating condensing is what they stand for. Very high energy efficiency, 90 plus AFUE. This does mean they are condensing, which means that they are going to drain water out as a normal part of their operation. It also means that they're going to be working their best in low water temperature applications, generally under 140, under 130 degrees to maximize that condensing potential. They have a very small footprint and they also have a very sophisticated piping system and a very sophisticated control system. They're used in both residential and in light commercial applications up to and including as large as uh, say like uh, uh, college gymnasiums and uh, uh, dormitory buildings and uh, things of that nature, uh, barracks and, and so forth. Very, very popular with radiant heating systems and other low temperature applications, including some domestic water heating applications. So that concludes our discussion of the major different types of boilers out there. We've got the old fashioned cast iron sectional boiler, which is still going strong today. The copper fin tube boiler, the water tube boiler, fire tube boiler, and the modulating and condensing boiler. And there are a couple of subsets out there that are hybrids of some of these. For example, uh, there is a condensing cast iron boiler out there, a modulating condensing cast iron boiler. There's only one that I know of. And you, you will find some other uh, unusual boiler systems out there. You may find a domestic water heater that is doing hydronic heating duty. All kinds of different things you'll find out there. But these are the major ones that you're going to run into in the field. Next, we're going to talk about emitters. And the emitters is where the heat leaves the system. Another word for emitter is load. Another word for boiler is the source. So the source or the boiler, this is the heat source of the whole system. This is where heat enters the system. The load or the emitter is where heat leaves the system. And there's a lot of different kinds of emitters out there and they could be mixed and matched in a single installation. So 
Um, this is one of the important things that you need to get down first when you're looking at a new boiler system is what type of emitters are we working with here? The oldest and the most classic style of emitter is the old-fashioned radiator, cast iron radiator. And this is radiant heat transfer primarily. We literally have this big old hot hunk of cast iron sitting in the room and it literally just shines heat outward. There's not a whole lot of air movement going on with a cast iron radiator. Now there is some, but not really appreciable amounts of air movement. You will see in some cases that people have taken an existing cast iron radiator and they build a box around it. They literally put a wooden box around it with an opening on the bottom and an opening on the top and they are trying to turn the whole radiator into a convector. Why? Well, because radiators limit your ability to place furniture in the room. Because they heat the room with that line of sight sh heat shine, anything placed in front of the radiator is going to limit its ability to heat the space. Drapes, uh, furniture, uh, other stuff like that that makes it really difficult to organize and decorate a room. So a lot of cast iron radiators have had shrouds built around them to turn them into convectors, which is uh, the heat transfer using air. Um, here's another example of a radiant system. This is radiant and convection because we actually do have that opening down here. This is a cast iron baseboard. These are going to be found in much older homes along with the cast iron radiators. Old homes from the turn of the century, 1900s, 1920s, 30s, 40s. We're going to find that these kinds of things installed there. They tended to fall out of favor after uh, the 1960s or so because they're heavy and they're hard to move around and they're hard to install. Uh, they kind of got replaced a lot around that time with this emitter, the fin tube baseboard. Copper fin tube baseboards hug the, the baseboard of the wall, and inside the baseboard is a fin tube element. This is like the uh, one thing that's kind of cool about boilers is you'll notice that the heat source and the heat emitter are mirror images of one another. So the copper fin tube baseboard is a mirror image of the copper fin tube heat exchanger. The uh, cast iron radiator is a mirror image of the cast iron sectional boiler. You can see the sections here bolted together. It's the same idea. Water in on the bottom, out on the top. Sometimes in on the bottom, out on the bottom. They, they're optional. So here we have a copper tube with aluminum fins around it encased in a metal shroud with an opening on the bottom and an opening on the top. Cool air falls to the floor, comes in contact with the hot element, and rises up and through. And this is what we call natural convection. These are what we call convectors, and I'm going to write this down on the bottom here. I want you to do the same. Natural convection. Natural convection is different than forced convection, hence forced air, right? Natural convection is also called gravity circulation because cool air is heavier and it falls toward the floor. And then the warm air that's heated by the convector rises up and we get this nice gentle circular flow of air through the room. In order for fin tube baseboards to do their best work, they have to be free from obstructions. The drapes, that we don't want the drapes hanging down over the front of the radiator. They need to stop short of where the opening on the uh, baseboard is. There's this little flapper right here, which can turn it on or turn it off. When it's closed, we don't get that airflow, and the uh, radiator or the baseboard is essentially off. So those need to be kept open. Um, the bottoms need to be kept clear. So if this is in a children's room, for example, and they're packing dirty clothes under the radiator or toys are getting are falling up under there, that can prevent that natural convection of air flowing through the baseboard. Another problem that these can experience is dust and dirt, a cat hair, dog hair, accumulating on the underside of the, um, of the fin tube. It's always a good idea, especially if we're experiencing a challenge heating one room, is you stick your fingers in here and you feel, uh, is it getting warm? 
You may need to feel over here in the corner because there will be a bare pipe over there so you can actually feel the pipe. If you feel the aluminum, it's just you're usually going to feel you know, room temperature. Feel the actual copper pipe and you know, see whether there's warm water circulating through it. And if you do have warm water circulating through and the problem is that it's not heating the room, you got to see what's preventing the airflow. It's kind of ironic that folks you know, will say, oh, hydronic is superior to air when so many of our terminal devices are actually heating air. And a convector is just that. It's an air heater. So we're heating the air, but we're heating it directly in the room. So stick your fingers underneath the, the uh, fin tube and scrape. See if you get a, a handful of dog hair or cat hair or people hair. <laughs> Maybe you might want to use gloves. Uh, that could be a, a reason why we're not heating well. Look to see if the condition of the shroud is good. Make sure that it's there. You know, if the whole shroud is just missing and there's just this heating element sitting there, it's not going to be nearly as effective. This whole thing is designed and sized to promote that circulation of air. And if the shroud is missing and there's just the, you know, the fin tube element there, it's not going to be nearly as effective. So a couple of things to keep in mind about uh, fin tube baseboards. They are absolutely everywhere. Uh, because they were so easy to install. <clears throat> Another thing I want you to be aware of with the fin tube baseboards is noise. Remember one of the advantages of hydronic heating is they're supposed to be silent. Well, as they get older, these aluminum fins that are literally clamped, they're not solder, but they're just clamped onto the copper tube. Over time, as they, through expansion and contraction, they'll loosen. They won't be clamped on as firmly as they were. If you're of a mind to, you can sometimes grab a hold of these fins and literally twist them on the pipe. And this is an indicator that they're getting loose. With age, as the hot water first flows through this pipe, that expansion is going to cause that looseness to move a little bit, and they'll start to click, and they'll make this irritating clicking sound for 10 or 15 minutes when the heat first comes on. And um, there is no solution for that generally. You might be able to get away with trying to bend the fins a little bit to create some more tension in there to get them to grip on the tube a little more tightly. There's no guarantee that that's actually going to be effective. And the real only solution is to replace all of the baseboard elements if they're clicking. Um, so that's a common complaint from folks. You know, their house may have been built in, say, 1974, and here it is in 2000, uh, whatever, and they're clicking, and they're going to click. There's nothing physically broken. Uh, another way that that click can happen is if a uh, copper pipe is run right through a wooden support member and the copper is touching the wooden support, it'll do the same thing. Very difficult to solve, definitely not cheap. But So when you hear that, realize, okay, we're looking at possibly replacing all these fin tube elements. And um, that can really sometimes bring into focus for the customer how irritating it really is. Because is it thousands and thousands of dollars irritating? Or mm, maybe not. But that's generally the solution. And most of the time when people get explained why that's taking place, then they, uh, they generally feel more comfortable with it. Most of the time they're used to it, but they're just worried that there might be something wrong. Now, a uh, copper fin baseboard is a heat emitter. And a lot of the time when sizing boilers, a lot of folks are going to go along and they're going to measure all the baseboard in the house. And they're going to assign a heat output for that amount of baseboard and size the boiler based on that. And that isn't always the best way to go. It's much more effective to size the boiler for an actual heat loss calculation for the house and then adjust the water temperature to accomplish what we need to accomplish. But here are the way um, baseboards are supposed to be sized. They're meant to be a certain amount of BTU output per linear foot. So the longer the baseboard is, the more BTU it puts out. The higher the water temperature is, the more BTU it puts out. Um, this is a chart from, I think it's a slant fin um, uh, baseboard, and it's pretty standard. Almost all three-quarter inch residential baseboard has an output very similar to this. 
And what this shows us is that at 140 degree water temperature, its output is 320 BTU per foot. So if we have 10 feet, that's 3200 BTU for that 10 foot section of baseboard. As water temperature gets higher, so does the BTU per foot output. And we're generally looking at a water temperature of around 180 to 200. And that is pretty much the sweet spot we look for. Copper fin baseboard is designed to operate with water te supply temperatures uh, around 180. Same thing with the uh, cast iron baseboards and the cast iron radiators. We're looking for 180 to 200 degree water. We generally round that to 180. So if you are in the mood for some reason and you need to calculate the BTU output of baseboard of an unknown variety and you don't have this handy dandy factory chart, use this rule of thumb, 600 BTU per linear foot. Now this can come in handy in a couple of ways. For example, you're called out to a house because room, uh, Johnny's room, the, the children's bedroom or whatever, isn't as warm as the rest of the house. And you identify that the boiler is operating correctly, um, the rest of everything is operating correctly. You um, verify that the shrouds are not bent or broken, that the damper is open, there's nothing blocking the baseboard, um, it's not got dog fur underneath it, it's all clean. Yet that room still is underperforming. The reason may be that there's just not enough baseboard in it. So what you can do is measure the length of the baseboard, look at your water temperature, and if it's 180 and 600 feet per foot, it may be just that there's not enough baseboard in there. I need to add more. And so this would be one way in order to prove that. Of course, you would then have to do a, a heat loss calculation on that room and identify, do I have enough baseboard to meet the heat loss or not? And if you don't, now you know. That's how you measure that. Uh, this is also somewhat helpful in diagnosing other problems. Remember, a lot of people over the years have decided to size boilers based on the length of baseboard, and that may or may not be appropriate. And when you're going back and trying to reverse engineer what was somebody thinking 15 or 20 years ago when they made this repair or they made that change or they installed this new boiler, this can be part of your bag of tricks is to measure all the baseboards, multiply the feet by 600, and lo and behold, that may be why that boiler size is there. And that may or may not be appropriate. So um, I'm not going to get too deep into that because that's a little more advanced for this uh, kind of early kind of a course. Uh, those of you who have been doing this for a little bit longer, uh, we should be sparking some recognition to say, ah, he's got something there. So other types of uh, some other types of uh, heat emitters we're going to talk about are water-to-air coils. And these are just like radiators in your car. Or these are very similar to the evaporator or condensing coil in an air conditioning or refrigeration system. Essentially, we've got a series of copper tubes running back and forth with aluminum fins in between to expand the surface area and allow us to transfer that heat from the water through the copper into the air. And by the way, we've got three different kinds of, or two different kinds of heat transfer happening here multiple times over. So we've got the hot water going into the copper. That is convection from water into copper. From the copper into the aluminum, that is conduction. From the aluminum into the air, that's convection again. And then ultimately from the air into the room, once again, another form of convection. You'll find uh, water to air coils located inside air ducts. You'll find them in uh, VAV systems. Uh, what happened here? There we go. You'll find them as individual unit heaters with the self-contained fans, maybe ducted, maybe not ducted, maybe just hanging out in space out there. All kinds of them in all different types of applications. Another form of heat exchanger we're going to find is called a tube and shell heat exchanger. Oh, by the way, these are also mirror images of the copper fin tube boiler. Tube and shell heat exchangers are mirror images of the tube and shell boiler or the shell and tube boiler, the fire tube boiler. But now what we have is we have water, one water stream flowing through the tubes and another water stream flowing through the shell. This allows us to exchange heat from one source of water 
into another source of water. These are going to be utilized sometimes as domestic water heaters. Sometimes we are going to use them in snow melt applications where we need to take high temperature boiler water and transfer it to low temperature glycol to be used in an outdoor snow melting application. Uh, sometimes they're going to be utilized in cooling towers to transfer heat from one stream of water into another and lots of different applications. Here we have both conduction and convection heat transfer. Another version of a water to water heat exchanger is called the flat plate heat exchanger. It's also known as a braised plate heat exchanger. In fact, flat plate and braised plate are sometimes used interchangeably, but there is actually a difference. These critters on the right are what are called flat plate. They are rebuildable, they are cleanable, and they are repairable. These are called braised plate, and they are not cleanable or repairable. Uh, they are also pretty expensive, but you get an enormous amount of heat transfer in a very, very, very small space. For example, this heat exchanger right here, this braised plate, would be big enough to fit in both of my hands, not that big. It might weigh three or four or five pounds, not very much, and it can pack a heat transfer rate of uh, 150,000 BTU or more. So a lot of heat transfer in a very, very small package. Here's kind of what they look like on the inside. We've got two supplies and two returns. So there's two water streams going through here. One is going to be the boiler water stream. The other is going to be the stream of what we're heating. That could be, say, for example, a swimming pool. And um, we've got uh, water is going to flow in between the two narrow pieces of metal together. One water stream is going to be going this way on one side, and the other water stream is going to be going the other way on the other side, and they'll alternate every other plate. They're incredibly energy efficient because the heat transfer surfaces are relatively large because they're all, there's a bunch of them just packed into a small space, but the heat transfer surface is huge, and the material is very thin. So it's very easy to get the heat to move from one water stream to the other through that metal plate. It's really great for keeping dissimilar types of water for either different makeup of water or different pressures separate from one another. For example, boiler water, you don't want to drink it. You don't want it mixing with your domestic water. But if you want to use a boiler to heat your domestic water, a heat exchanger is necessary to keep those two water streams separate. Also, your domestic water is going to be a higher pressure than your boiler water is going to be. Lots of reasons why we don't want those two water streams to mix. And in those applications, a heat exchanger is the way to go. Another kind of water heat exchanger is called an indirect fired water heater. It looks very similar to a standard electric water heater tank. And if you've never seen one before, it can be confusing because you will see domestic water pipes going into and out of it, and you will see boiler pipes going into and out of it. And that can make it seem as though the uh, same water is in both pipes, but it's not. Deep inside of the water tank is a heat exchanger, and this is where the boiler water, the boiler water is flowing through this coil, and it is surrounded by the domestic water in the tank. So this acts kind of like the heating element in an electric water heater. This is the heating element. So we've got hot boiler water circulating through here. Meanwhile, the domestic water surrounds it and is being heated by the boiler. These things are awesome. They last a long time, They're usually made of stainless steel, uh, so they last forever. Uh, they heat water really, really fast, and we're using all of the heating power and energy efficiency of the boiler to heat the water tank. So hot water recovery is almost instantaneous in a lot of cases. The water uh, almost never runs out, depending on the application, and they're really, really nice. Um, you're going to see a lot of applications where you'll find a, a standard boiler and a conventional electric or gas water heater right next to it. When we're going in to do some changes, let's combine the two, and we're going to have a much more energy efficient, long-lasting, and effective domestic water heating system using the boiler as the engine of that system. That covers the major boiler types and the major emitter types. The last thing we're going to talk about today is piping styles. Uh, there's a quite a few different piping styles. We're going to cover the basics here, 
learning how to walk before we crawl. So when we're talking about piping types, there's two different major kinds of piping. There's boiler piping and there's system piping. We call that the boiler side and the system side. Earlier I said it's easy for a technician to put the blinders on and get pigeonholed in the boiler room and only focus on the boiler side. And the boiler side is, of course, very, very important. But equally important is the system side. So the boiler side contains the boiler itself, usually the circulator pumps, usually the controls, and what's called the near boiler piping. Out there in the system, however, is the other half of the whole assembly. And what is happening out here in the system can also affect what's happening in the boiler room. And if you don't leave the boiler room and go out into the rest of the building and look at the system, you could be missing the whole source of the problem. And I've personally been involved in lots of these situations. Some of them I caused myself. But as I got more experience, it was more me going afterwards and saying, hey, uh, they're still having a problem. What can you find out? And come to find out that the technicians were always in the boiler room, didn't see anything wrong. But the problem was out in the system. So just be really conscious that what happens out here affects what happens in here and vice versa. What happens in here affects what happens out here. And that's what it's supposed to work, right? You have this heat source here, the heat delivery out here. Well, if you can't deliver it very well, you're going to have problems over here. But the solution ends up being over here. So don't forget about the system. It's very important. So you want to at least know what kind of a distribution system do you have in whatever boiler system you're looking at. Because different distribution systems affect the boiler room somewhat differently, or they can. So the first and most basic type of distribution system we're going to talk about is called the series loop piping. Series loop piping is very simple. We have one pipe leaving the boiler as supply, and it enters the first emitter, leaves the first emitter, and goes right into the second emitter. Very simple, very economical, and was frequently used in smaller homes. And when I say small, I generally mean under 1,000, 1,100 square feet. In larger homes, in larger loops, it can become a problem because the last emitter generally is receiving lower temperature water than the first emitter was, and that can result in uneven heat. So you may discover that uh, someone's complaining that, man, this side of the house is a lot colder than this side of the house, and when we investigate the piping system, well, that explains why. Now, what should have happened originally when this system was constructed is if we're using copper fin baseboard, which most of them do, is this baseboard, if this room and this room are the same size room, this baseboard should be bigger than this one to account for that difference in temperature. But most of the time when these were put together, that wasn't done. Or maybe it wasn't possible because both these rooms are the same size and you can't fit more baseboard in this one. Possibly. Or they just bought six footers for all the rooms and that's what they put in there. <laughs> Sometimes you'll see that too. When maybe they should have had a four foot in this room and an eight foot in that one. Just, you know, for example. So be aware those are some of the problems that we experience with series loop uh, because of that temperature difference. As the water passes through the different emitters, the last one kind of gets the short end of the stick, essentially. Uh, by the way, I want to mention this symbol here means pump. When you see a circle with a triangle in the middle of it, that is the universal symbol for circulator pump. And the pump usually points, the triangle usually points in the direction of water flow. So here we have water in here, water out there. The, uh, the quick and easy solution that the industry came up with to avoid the drawbacks of series loop piping, but try to maintain the economy of the series loop installation and the small number of pipes it was is called the Monoflow T series piping system. You're going to see these in homes installed, oh, probably sometime between the late 50s through the 1970s up to the 1980s. Uh, they still make monoflow T uh, fittings, but they're not nearly as commonly installed today as they were in those days. So generally, that's, those are the types of homes that you're going to see these in. 
seeing them in commercial buildings is going to be less common than in residential. But hey, people use your creativity out there and just about anything goes. So you've got to understand what the mono flow system is. The mono flow system is, consists of one pretty much main loop of pipe that runs around the whole perimeter of the structure. And coming off of that is a T, which will branch off, feed through a radiator, and come back into the main, or feed through a baseboard, most likely, and come back into the main. What is there going to cause water to want to take this long way around to go out of the main, back through the baseboard, and back into the main? And that device is called a diverter T. And the diverter T is the heart of the monoflow system. Here's what they look like on the inside. Come on. Ah, sorry about that. There they are. This is what they look like on the inside. There's a restrictor in there of one of several types. And here's one example. There's a restrictor. So as water is coming down the main, it's going to jam into that restrictor, and some of it is going to be forced to go around the service road <laughs> or the bypass or the long way around. And that's how the monoflow system works. Now this helps alleviate some of the challenges that we had with the series loop piping because as the water is going around, say we've got 180 degree water coming out of here, and some of that 180 degree water comes into here and it comes back obviously cooler because it's given up some of its heat through the emitter, but it rejoins this 180 degree water stream. So the resulting water temperature falls, but not quite as much as it falls in the series loop system. This allows the emitter to be most effective and it also reduces that um, around, the, around the way temperature drop problem. It doesn't eliminate it, but it, it, it alleviates it somewhat. And so um, this kind of gives us a good compromise between economy of piping and effectiveness of heating. Here's some monoflow T's in real life. You can see the T here, and it's actually labeled supply, and it has an arrow on it, which means this is the direction of flow. And there's that little branch line. So here we have that main coming along, and it branches off goes up to the emitter, goes through the emitter, comes back, and rejoins the main as such. So that's the basic idea. And so as you're walking around the basement, you're looking around and go, hey, wow, that person really did a nice job on fitting all of that up. And it does look nice. I think the electrician here might need to get talked to. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the plumber or the HVAC guy that piped this up did a real nice job. And that's what a monofluid T system is. The next kind of system is called manifold piping. And this is pretty deluxe here, because now we have a uh, basically just a one main supply and one main return manifold. And off of that manifold is a branch line that is dedicated to each emitter. So here we can follow the supply, and it comes off and goes to one emitter and comes back to the return. It comes off the supply, goes to the next emitter, and back to the return. In this manner, every emitter gets exactly the right temperature of water. They're all the same temperature of water. And the circulator pump controls the flow through them. This is also a much more expensive installation because there's a lot more pipe to put in, a lot more joints to cut and solder, a lot more holes to drill. And uh, so while this completely eliminates all the problems of the series system, it, it brings in a whole bunch of problems of cost and time on the installation. A, a uh, kind of ha halfway compromise between the two is called the manifold series piping. And here the distribution network is broken up into zones where um, we'll have several emitters in series, but not all of them. So here, this really simplifies the installation. We get the best of all worlds in that uh, each emitter is pretty much getting the warm water that it needs. Uh, uh, and we don't we eliminate that kind of you know redheaded stepchild zone that isn't getting heated properly. And we get pretty decent economy, really good heating, and it's kind of the best of all worlds. This is probably the most common style of piping system in a home that is zoned. For example, you can see we have two distinct zones of heating. Here's one, and here's another. This could be upstairs or downstairs. This could be the east side and the west side, uh, or any combination thereof. 
It's very easy to zone this into independent by controls by putting an automatic valve here and an automatic valve here, and then we deliver the heated water to the zone when needed, stop it from going when it's not needed. Uh, like I said, most common type of system on a zoned residential installation. As we get larger into um, bigger systems, we get um, we get um, bigger piping. We get more expensive. This is called the extended manifold direct return, where we have a supply leaving the boiler and pretty much going all the way down the building to the very, very end. And then another main pipe beginning at that end and coming all the way back to the boiler. Pipe in between are the branch lines. So here's one branch coming back in. Here's another branch coming back into the return. So there's a circulator running continuously that's circulating water back and forth. We'll often have an automatic valve at each one of these emitters to allow the water to go through the emitter or not. And one of the problems with this system is that we have an unequal uh, flow path. And for example, the distance between the boiler through this emitter and back to the boiler is pretty short. That's where all the water is going to want to go. It's just going to want to go here. The water is not really going to want to push all the way down here and come back through. So in order to make this work, we have to add the expense of putting balancing valves in each one of these branch lines to equal the flow through the whole system. Uh, and, and that will often be done or not done. Sometimes they're eliminated as a source of value engineering, and that leads to its own set of problems. And then you get another reason to stick your head up in the drop ceiling and observe what kind of system you have. I'm missing a slide here, so I'm going to describe this. There's a third type of uh, extended manifold, and it's called extended manifold reverse return. And the extended manifold reverse return, this return line actually doubles all the way back and begins here. So that the first radiator to supply will be the last to return. And that means that the distance for this emitter and for this emitter are equal. And um, that is much more expensive because now we need a third main line running the whole length of the building. But it, it reduces the need for balancing and it gives us much more even flow. You're going to see piping systems like that in large, high-value buildings that are meant to last for a very long time. I'm talking things like your, your, your seat of government, uh, your university buildings, your um, um, hospitals, and uh, very high-value, very important, long-lasting uh, public-type buildings, military buildings, things like that. They're meant to last a long time. They're meant to have the best, and that would be a representation of that. And you don't always recognize an extended manifold reverse return when you stick your head up in the ceiling and you see a great big old pipe with a label that says heating supply and arrows going that way. And then right next to it is another big pipe of equal size that says heating return with arrows going that way. And right next to that is another pipe that says heating return with arrows going that way. So you can kind of envision the water going out, going this way, and going back in kind of like a big, long, elongated S-shaped snake. That is that extended manifold reverse return. OK, so last thing I want to talk about is what we call the 20 degree delta T. Like I said earlier, delta T means difference in temperature. And a lot of our hydronic heating systems are designed around and meant to operate based on a 20 degree temperature difference. And this is true on both the boiler side and it's true on the returns or on the system side, on the load side or the emitter side. As water passes through the boiler, it should rise in temperature 20 degrees. This gives us the most effective transmission of energy from the flame into the passing water and avoids some problems. Now, as I said earlier, the greater the temperature difference, the faster the heat transfer, right? So it makes sense that the greater the temperature difference across the boiler, the better the heat transfer, and that's true. But check this out. 
If our standard hot water supply temperature is 180 degrees, which it is for all of the supply systems, the piping systems, and the emitters we talked about so far, and then the re standard return temperature would then be 160 for a 20 degree delta T. But what if we had a 40 degree delta T? That would be better for heat transfer, but then we're getting into that cold water coming back to the boiler. We're worrying about uh, condensing temperatures and a condensing uh, heat exchanger. That's one reason why our 20 degree delta T is what it is. As we're on the way up to 180, we have to pass 160 and 170, and then our return water temperatures are still 20 degrees lower than that. So while our supply water is 170, our return water is only 150, and so on and so forth. So the 20 degree difference gives us a good heat transfer and basically uh, avoid some of the problems with low return water temperature. Now in order for that to work, we also have to have a 20 degree delta across the emitters. So we are adding heat here and we need to be rejecting heat at the same rate across the emitters. And this is all related to water flow rate. And I'm just going to touch on this briefly now and as we talk about circulators later we'll talk about it a little more. The faster the water flows through a system, the less it changes in temperature. The less effective it is at picking up heat in the boiler, and the less effective it is at releasing heat in the emitter. If you've ever been playing with a lighter, and you've been you know, moving your hand across the lighter, you know that if you move your hand across the flame very quickly, it doesn't burn you. You don't really absorb any heat into your skin. But if you move your hand across the flame more slowly, well, now you've burned yourself. And we all can imagine that. Well, imagine the same thing happening inside the boiler, is that water is rushing through the boiler quickly. It's not very able to actually absorb any of the heat energy from that flame. Same thing on the load side. As the water rushes through the emitter quickly, it doesn't have much of an opportunity to release its heat uh, into the conditioned space. The way we solve that problem is, number one, we measure the supply water temperature and we measure the return water temperature. And if those two temperatures are too close together, what we need to do is slow the water flow down until we reach that 20 degree difference. We can do that by partially closing a valve on the supply side to reduce the flow rate through the boiler or uh, changing the circulator pump's speed or changing the pump altogether or using balancing valves, something of that nature. Those are just some rough ideas right now. What we'll experience when we do that, and you'll find this everywhere you go, you're going to find lots of systems that have too high of a flow rate. If you damper that down a little bit and get to that 20 degree difference, instead of say a 5 or 10 degree difference, you get to that 20 degree difference and suddenly the home is more comfortable. The heating bills go down. Because that whole time we were rushing that water through that boiler and not picking up heat, we're still running the burner, and that heat was going right up the chimney to heat the birds. Uh, so pay attention to your delta T. Make sure it's within range and realize that your delta T is directly related to flow rate through the boiler. The last thing we want to talk about today is some common uh, GPM flow rates and BTU capacity in common pipe sizes. Uh, and this is kind of just for reference. So real quick, half-inch pipe, generally good for 15,000 BTU. Uh, Three-quarter pipe, which is pretty much the standard in all of our uh, uh, manifold uh, series loop piping, 40,000 BTU per three-quarter inch branch. These are some of the rules of thumb that a lot of our systems were designed around back in the day. One inch, good for up to 80,000. Inch and a quarter, up to 140. Two inch, up to 450. And these are the GPMs that are recommended for hydronic heating. If you're a plumber, you know that three-quarter inch pipe can handle a heck of a lot more than four GPM. But on hydronic heating, we want slow, quiet water flows, and that's why these GPM rates are so low. And that brings us right to the conclusion of our, uh, of our show today. I want to um, thank you all for coming today and be ready for next week's session. There is going to be an exam that is going to be released in, uh, within 48 hours of now, so make sure you check that out and hit the high points of today's class. Uh, I want to thank you all for uh, coming today, 
and I really look forward to getting into this with you as we move further in this course. Like I said before, we've got to crawl before we can walk, before we can run, and everything that we've talked about today, it lays the foundation for everything that we're going to talk about moving forward into the rest of our class sessions together. So uh, the big things that I want you to pay attention to today are, number one, what kind of boiler do you have? Is it a cast iron sectional boiler? Is it a copper fin tube boiler? Is it a water tube? Is it a fire tube? Is it a mod con? Or some unusual kind of boiler that might maybe you need to study a little bit before you go too much further. Number two, what direction is the water flowing? Looking at your boiler is going to help you identify which way the water flows. Remember on the cast iron, it comes in at a low level and leaves at a higher level. On a copper fin tube, the water enters and leaves on the same level, but look for labels, look for the circulator pump arrows or the hump, and look for the sensing element that tells you where the hottest part of the boiler is. And then, what kind of a distribution system do you have? What kind of piping system do you have? What kind of emitters are out there? Because that depends on what type of water temperature they need, what type of flow rates do they need, and so on. And then, as we're going to start talking about in future weeks, what kind of, ex where are my accessories? Like circulators, like expansion tanks, like fill valves and, and many relief valves and many of the other things that we're going to talk about next week. So, until then, I want to thank you all for coming. It's been my distinct pleasure, and I look forward to seeing you again. Until then, so long. Have a great week.